So we're going to be looking at uh, the many ways in which crowdfunding opens up investment with uh, Eric uh, Markowitz from Inc. Magazine. He's going to be leading the session with Jalak Jombunputra from F uh, Future Perfect Ventures, Sky Fernandez from uh, Centripetal Capital Partners, Jessica Jackley, Jackley of Kiva and the Collaborative Fund, and Amy Cortez, who is the uh, author of Loca Vesting. Please help me in welcoming Eric from Inc. Magazine and, uh, and the rest of the panelists. Cheers. Thank you, Toby. Um, I realize we're the panel that separates you guys from lunch, so that's a tough, tough role to fill, but I think we'll keep this interesting. Um, my name is Eric Markowitz. I, I write for Inc. Magazine. I write about uh, entrepreneurs. I write about venture capital startups, and so invariably, uh, my world has been consumed by crowdfunding for the last couple of years. Uh, I've been following it uh, pretty closely, especially since last April, since the Jobs Act. Um, and, and this is a really, this is a very unique panel, I think, because uh, we often hear of crowdfunding as, and I think it's strange that it's, it's portrayed this way, as uh, the alternative to venture capital. If, you, if uh, there's this sort of um, view that, well, it's for entrepreneurs that maybe can't get traditional VC funds. Um, and I, I don't think that's true at all. And I think the investors we have with us today, as well as one journalist, um, have been really looking at crowdfunding as a, a way to expand their portfolio and to, um, and to find new entrepreneurs. And, and, and I think they're also um, realistic about uh, the future of, of crowdfunding, especially for non-accredited investors. Um, so before I um, mumble on, uh, I'm going to bring up uh, Jalak Jobin Putra. Um, Jalak is the, is the managing partner of uh, Future Perfect Ventures. And we were chatting before. and. Uh, it's pretty incredible to me that she's made investments all over the world, um, not just in, in New York or Silicon Valley or um, Boston or Austin. Um, it's really a global fund. Um, so why don't you introduce yourself and, and tell us a little bit about um, the types of entrepreneurs you're, you're investing in and the types of startups you're looking at these days? Sure. Um, it's great, great to be here and, and discuss um, what I think is a very important topic. Um, I, uh, New fund here in New York called Future Perfect Ventures. Um, I think we're on. No. Thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, the, the focus of, uh, of the fund is investing in uh, post-seed and, and small Series A investments. Um, uh, we have heard a lot about how much seed funding has happened over the last um, you know, two to three years. And I, I see a gap in um, funding uh, before the Series A. And so this fund is uh, meant to address that. The thesis of the fund is uh, around interpretive intelligence. It's really making uh, technology truly seamless with the rest of our lives, and it, uh, it, uh, it includes financial services, healthcare, IT, uh, and uh, education as well as commerce. Okay, um, so I have a couple of questions. I want to start first with um, crowdfunding, since that's really the theme of, the, of today. Um, how, how do you, as 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 an early stage investor, how are you looking at, at crowdfunding? Um, is it is it a platform that that you have explored yet, um, or is it something that you've stayed away from so far? Well, I've certainly uh, uh, looked at companies that have been uh, crowdfunded. Um, I, I actually think it's been a very positive uh, development in, in the industry because, um, you know, as a professional investor, there's only so much time I and my colleagues have to uh, evaluate investments. And, um, and, and so to the extent that entrepreneurs can get some early, early stage funding uh, for proof of concept, um, some early customers. Uh, alpha and beta products, uh, and then I can take a look at, at the company based on that traction and then use my network and, and capital to help accelerate to the next stage of growth. Um, I, I think it's, it's been a positive uh, impact. So obviously you, you are a professional investor. Um, you've been doing this for almost 20 years or so, um, and you were there for, <laughs> Jalik told me before um, that she was in Silicon Valley from 1999 to 2003, um, which I thought was a pretty... Um, Interesting. Uni unique <laughs> yes. uh, so she's seen the ups and downs. Um, and one thing that uh, Title III would address would be unaccredited investors. Um, and I've, I've always been curious about how investors view unaccredited investors uh, and how would they influence the market in terms of the types of companies that would be launched and 
their perspective long-term returns. Yeah, so I, like, we're talking about a wide range of businesses, everything from you know, maybe a mom and pop store or a, a small designer uh, creating you know, a lifestyle business all the way through to potentially you know, venture scalable businesses. I mean, because as, as a VC, right, um, I, I need to uh, create multiple of investment of my original investment back to my investors. So I can only invest in, in companies that, that can scale to a certain size. Um, so I, I feel like crowdfunding can, can really address uh, some of the businesses that may not be in that category and, and, and allow entrepreneurs to, to build nice businesses and, and, uh, you know, uh, for themselves and, and for their uh, communities. Um, I do worry about, um, you know, David mentioned some of this. I mean, as someone who's been a professional investor for a while, um, it, you know, there are a lot of risks associated uh, with uh, equity funding and uh, you really have to go in uh, not expecting your money back um, necessarily. And, and uh, so, I mean, I don't because I'm a, prof <laughs> you know, I'm a professional investor and I, I need to have, I, I do the diligence to make sure or, or ensure that I have a high probability of getting my money back. But, um, you know, a lot of businesses just don't succeed and, and so uh, I I think diligence is important. I think controls are going to be important to protect entrepreneurs as well as the investors to protect against you know, lawsuits down the road. Right, so there's the regulatory angle, but I think another interesting point to that is, is expe expectations. Yes. Uh, so how, do you, um, how would you communicate expectations to a, a first-time investor, um, someone that's, that's looking at a, a, a crowdfunding platform um, and in the future where there is equity-based crowdfunding? Um, how do you communicate that the odds of success are quite low, and um, what sort of advice would you have to, to people that are considering this? So, so uh, there, there are a few things that I, I think can contribute to, uh, to, uh, to success, or at least getting you know, your money back. And one is, uh, I think, investing in areas that you know, and you can actually potentially add value to help grow the business. Um, and, and that's what we uh, do as VCs, or we should be doing as VCs, right? Um, and, and so uh, if you're able to con help contribute to the success of the company, I, I think uh, uh, making sure that you're on top of uh, you know, the, the business and, and the developments in the business. I mean, we don't like to see surprises in, in, uh, you know, in the venture world. I like to keep uh, lines of communication open. So if there are challenges that arise, which there always will be, uh, you know, the board or investors can help, um, you know, help the entrepreneur uh, grow. And then the other, you know, the other point I'd say is um, when you're looking at a company that, you know, may get venture funding down the road, your, your stake may be diluted. And, you know, it, it, and especially in down markets like we saw, you know, post-99, uh, um, post-2008, um, uh, VCs came in and and often you know reset the term earlier you know terms and uh, that's the only way the business could survive. But um, if you're looking at a business that's going to need a lot of funding down the road, it's it's less probable that you're going to be able to get your money back unless you know it's it's a Twitter or something like that. So um, I'm going to bring up uh, Sky Fernandez. Uh, Sky is, is also an investor. He's with uh, Centripetal Capital Partners in, in New York. Um, oh, I see we're doing like a, like a Tonight <laughs> Show format. Um, <laughs> hi, Sky. Uh, so Sky is going to talk a little bit about um, something that, that's pretty close to him, which uh, I'm not sure how many people know about uh, what's called the missing middle. Uh, it, it, it refers to a funding gap between very, very early stage uh, investments and, and really like a Series A investment, which would be for a million plus. Um, and, and typically, um, the missing middle refers to investments in the range of $100,000 to a million dollars. And, and Sky has an interesting perspective because, um, well, I'll let him tell you, but essentially that he believes that crowdfunding can fill this, this funding gap. So can you talk a little bit about um, why this is important, what the problem is, and, and how crowdfunding can address it? Sure. Um, <coughs> is this on? Um, so yeah, the, the missing middle term has been around for a while, um, but it was never really given a, a definition. Um, and I launched the missing middle initiative, uh, the World Economic Forum, a few years ago. Um, and last year was invited to a TED talk on the missing middle initiative. Um, and essentially had a few goals for it. First was to really define what the missing middle was. Um, sometimes it had been referred to uh, SMEs, small to medium sized businesses. 
Other times it was referred to as the gap in capital that early stage companies need. Um, and after doing a lot of work with a lot of advisors, we came up with the, the definition of the missing middle would really be the size of capital between about $100,000 to $2 million. Um, and the reason that we came with that definition was we looked at the, the landscape of where capital was certainly was, the, was gapping. Um, and it, both in the US and internationally, that size of gap capital seems to be actually what is the most missing, no matter whether you're in the US, in Africa, Latin America, India. Um, the question was, well, why does this missing middle even exist? You know, why has it not been filled by angel investors um, or, or venture funds? And it was interesting. It came to be uh, a simple math problem. Um, if you take a traditional $100 million fund or above that, uh, but at a $100 million fund, if they were to invest that in a million dollar increments or $500,000 increments, you'd have to do 100 investments. And most uh, venture funds only have you know, three to five managers. And it's hard to do 100 investments in that year, in that number of years. So that doesn't work. What also doesn't work um, is if you're uh, at a 2% management fee, if you guys are familiar with how funds are actually financed, you take a 2% management fee, which is what the general partners of the fund get to survive on. Um, and 2% of 100 million is $2 million, so that covers your salary, overhead, due diligence, lawyers, et cetera. Um, but as you start moving down to a 10 to a $50 million fund, it just doesn't work anymore. 2% for the, the fund to survive doesn't work for salaries and overhead. And, uh, but it does work on the other side for actually being able to make investments between the 100,000 to $2 million size. So the question was, what can we do to start creating smaller funds that can financially work? Because remember, funds are a business too. Um, one of the key points that I brought up in the TED Talk was we need to figure out how capital can not just be a source for financing innovation, but how can capital itself innovate? Um, and so that was what we tried to do. We tried to create new fund structures that hadn't been created before, and we created different ones. One for social-focused funds, another for impact investing funds, and a third for return-focused funds. Um, and it's interesting, when, with the, over the past about five years, 75% of the missing middle funds have been created, um, really creating what I call an emerging asset class within the early stage investing space. Um, and on top of that, uh, beyond it being an emerging asset class, you really are finding that it's helping to fill what I call the funding food chain from companies from really early stage to seed to angel to VC all the way through. You need that capital. And there's a variety of solutions that are going to fill the missing middle. It's certainly the accelerators that are being created, um, new missing middle funds. Uh, but crowdfunding is clearly playing a space with that as well. Um, and it's exciting to see how both crowdfunding for equity and debt um, is filling that. Um, and obviously right now it's only for accredited investors, but hopefully soon for non-accredited. I have one more question, um, then we're going to move to Jessica Jackley. Uh, during, during David's um, talk a few minutes ago, um, this guy ran up to me and said, I disagree. Uh, and, and you mentioned um, you have uh, a hybrid model of, I, I guess, impact investing? Correct. Um, so, so tell us why you disagree um, with what David was saying and, and how your model um, maybe uh, approaches what he was saying. Sure, I think David, if, if David and I actually spoke for 20 minutes, we'd probably come to an agreement. Uh, but I think the initial disagreement that we have is he was disagreeing with the spectrum, that there wasn't anything in between. Um, and when we were creating these three different fund structures for missing middle funds, uh, there was a clear thing. He's, David's absolutely right, I think, on the fact of there is for-profit and non-profit. Um, but what you have is when you have impact investing, you are shooting for a fund that typically is shooting for a lower amount of returns than a pure return focus fund. Um, and the way that we structured these funds were, were brilliant. Um, I thought that uh, what we came was the investors in that fund, some investors are pure return focused investors and others are purely social return investors. And the way that they invest in that fund is they take the first loss of any capital in that fund. And the return focused investors get a disproportionate amount of the returns of that fund. So you have two different types of investors in an impact investing fund, and that's how you get to work. Granted, some people are purely doing it for returns, others are purely doing it for social returns, um, but there is that gradient. Um, but I think it's more of a gradient of the amount of returns. A pure return focused fund is shooting for a 30% plus IRR, but uh, impact investing funds typically shooting for anywhere between a, a 10 to 20% IRR. Um, I'm going to bring up uh, Jessica Jackley. Uh, yeah, I guess we'll play some musical chairs here. Uh, <laughs> hi, Jessica. Hi. Uh, in case you guys are not familiar with who Jessica Jackley is, she is um, the founder of 
Kiva, a co-founder, co-founder, co um, and I believe the chief marketing officer at the time. Yep. Um, she's now a VC uh, with the Collaborative Fund, who have um, made a number of uh, early stage investments um, in 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 some very known brands, um, even within the crowdfunding world. I believe they're an investor in Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. um, so, not to um, not to make this start off on a on a negative note, but what are for entrepreneurs specifically? Um, what do you think some of the most the biggest mi misconceptions or myths about crowdfunding is? Okay, why is it negative? By the way, that's not. You're right. That's not a okay. negative question. Okay. Um, Great. Well, thank you for having me. And it's nice to be here. And it's nice to see some familiar, familiar faces. Um, although this weather is not that nice. <laughs> um, I, I guess I think uh, one of the other things that I've gotten to be involved with over the last several years is, is, is as a co-founder of ProFounder, which was, um, gosh, we started in 2009, actually, to create sort of a do-it-yourself kit uh, of tools and resources for entrepreneurs to do as much as you can do crowdfunding in the pre Jobs Act world. So one of the things that we saw there is that there was an incredibly steep learning curve for almost every single entrepreneur. I mean, being an entrepreneur and doing uh, offering securities to your investors is, is, a, is a confusing and complicated process, no matter how much you want to simplify that process. And that was the whole point of what we wanted to do. We wanted very badly to simplify it. But it was still complicated, still complex, especially when not only the investor might, the, not only the entrepreneur might be new, to that process, but also investors. And so one of the things we, we were surprised by was the amount of education every entrepreneur needed and the amount of education that each of their investors needed. So you had to have fully equipped and very confident, um, well-educated entrepreneurs to have the raises work well. And many of them did work well. Uh, but often we'd not just educate those entrepreneurs, but they, they would sort of come back to us after having talked to a few of their would-be investors who had thrown questions at them that they, they, they didn't know how to answer. Um, so we had to, we had to do a, spend a lot of time with them. So I guess one thing that entrepreneurs may not expect, or one of the myths might be that it's really simple and straightforward, right? It can't, it, we're getting there. We're, I think we're all working together to make it more simple and straightforward and accessible, but it is, a, at the end of the day, a complicated process. And so there's going to be a lot of education that each entrepreneur will need to just take on for themselves. So it's one. Yeah. Um, so in your work as a VC with Collaborative Fund, um, how does your fund approach uh, crowdfunding um, now and potentially in the future um, when it is opened up? Yeah. I mean, so in general, the Collaborative Fund uh, focuses on the sharing economy. We find and fund and support entrepreneurs that really understand and believe in collaborative consumption, collaborative creation, um, buying, not just buying, not just the sort of traditional insistence on ownership, but a, the trend uh, more towards a, sh a sharing economy and more towards access as opposed to that traditional ownership model. So what we get excited about are individuals that see this trend that can that are building technologies and building companies that take advantage of that. And crowdfunding is just one of many sort of themes within, I think, the overall sharing economy movement. Um, when it comes to a, a VC's perspective on crowdfunding, um, how do you structure a deal that makes it palatable for you as an investor in terms of equity shared with, with other investors in the deal? I don't think that that's a bad question. I don't know that I'm the right person to answer that particular one. Um, I mean, I think in general there's some really high-level concepts. I mean, obviously, if you really believe in a deal, and you know, we see it as pretty black and white. Either we're all in, or you know, if anyone has doubts about the thing, we figure those we figure those out. So when everyone on our team is in and excited about a deal, obviously you want to go, you want to be as bullish as you can and get in as as early as you can with as much equity as, as you possibly can and lead the round or whatever. So of course we have our own parameters about how much we put in, even when it's the most promising thing ever. If they're raising more than we put into each deal, then we put in as much as we can, and we cheer them on. If there's only a little bit left, and when we really believe in them and want to get in anyway, we do that. Um, maybe we'll address that question when we have the, the full panel up here. Um, for now, I want to invite up uh, Amy Cortese. Oh, um, do you, sorry. Yeah, yeah sorry. thank you. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, Amy is the uh, the is a fellow journalist and uh, the author of Locavesting, um, and so she's been deeply embedded in this uh, in, in this world for quite a few years. Um, and so, um, thank you, Amy, for for joining us. Sure, thank you. Uh, we um, let's talk about your book first. Um, why did you decide to write this book, uh, Locavesting, and what is it about? Yeah, um, can you hear me? Is this picking up? Yes. Okay. Um, the catalyst for me for writing the book Locavesting um, was really the financial crisis. So, um, you know, 
I, like many people and journalists, I was outraged by these big banks that took us to the brink of economic collapse and then just kind of skated away. And meanwhile, you know, people were dealing with foreclosures and, you know, neighborhood blight from all the closed up um, homes and, you know, their 401ks were ravaged. Um, so what I saw was that not only were people looking for alternatives to Wall Street, they were actually out there creating them. And I thought that was pretty cool. So that's kind of what led to the book. And by the way, this was um, pre-Jobs Act. Jessica was doing Pro ProFounder. Um, but there really wasn't a lot of um, crowdfunding aside from Kickstarter was pretty new then as well. So um, since that time, um, I think the Jobs Act really, you know, um, is, is a game changer and has really um, supercharged uh, this whole discussion. Um, you know, uh, uh, Jessica mentioned uh, the sharing economy before, um, and, I, and I think that, that, that crowdfunding and the sharing economy are in some ways linked um, in sort of a, 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 in a trend sort of cultural way. Um, people want more ownership in the things mm -hmm. that they use. Um, people look at, look at their own assets um, as potential um, revenue ge generating uh, machines. So, so in your experience and in, in sort of the, the research for your book, you interviewed, I'm sure, hundreds of people. Um, what, can you describe this shifting attitude um, and, and maybe how it plays into the, the rise of crowdfunding? Yeah, it's really very much um, part of the sharing economy. I mean, I find that um, people, not only do they want to invest more meaningfully, but they want connections in a lot of things. And, you know, it's interesting, a lot of the local investing movement started with um, food. And I think that's because of this, you know, kind of eat local movement that we've had for a while. People go to farmers markets. We care now where our food comes from, how it was produced. And I think that sort of idea is spreading now to other areas and um, in finance as well. I mean, people want to know where their money is going, who it's supporting, and you know, what is its, its broader impact in the world. Um, there's obviously a difference between uh, a traditional uh, startup that, that is looking for that like hockey stick type growth, and then there's going to be the traditional mom and top, pop type stores. Um, so can you talk about the more of the latter, um, the, the potential market for loans to existing mm -hmm. businesses? Um, how yeah. big is this market for crowdfunding particularly? Um, that's a very good question. I, I think there's a lot of confusion um, over that because we, we tend to talk about equity crowdfunding when in fact um, I think crowd investing or investment crowdfunding is a better term because um, a loan is a security uh, as is a revenue sharing agreement. So it doesn't just have to be equity in a startup. Um, it can be a loan or a revenue sharing um, arrangement with an existing small business. And in many ways, I think that might be the bigger market. Um, these companies are established. They have a track record. It's a little bit less risky if you're um, you know, a small investor kind of dipping your toe uh, in this water. That's interesting. So maybe maybe we should open up to the general um, panel now, because I think Jessica would have a pretty unique perspective on that from your work with Kiva. Um, so maybe if you could tell us a little bit about how um, the world of microlending and crowdfunding intersect, um, and, and what are some of the implications of that intersection? Sure. So um, all right, let's think back. Uh, in, the, in the beginning, way back, before we were calling it crowdfunding, very old school, um, Basically, I mean, microfinance exists in the world. It has for decades. And of course, microfinance, I mean, we're all, I'm preaching to the choir, but think financial products and services for the working poor, microloans, tiny loans, yeah, we're all on the same page. Um, so that exists, and it had existed pre-Kiva and everything. What, what we did with Kiva, of course, was try to re reveal more of that process, put it online, and give individuals like you and me the opportunity to participate in that, to participate in the stories of these entrepreneurs working so hard to, you know, do what they do. Um, I'm tempted to go into lots of stories, but I know we, we go to the website, it's really fun, you can read them. So basically, the intersection uh, that I think exists now is that yes, there are opportunities to participate more in all sorts of entrepreneurial activities that are going on in the world. Microfinance, micro lending is just one segment of that, um, and Kiva was one of the first to put that online and allow people to contribute to those small loans for individuals. So I think that's basically the way that those two worlds intersect. Okay. Um, Jalak, I want to go back to you. Um, we, we, were, we were chatting a little bit before about maybe some of the limitations of crowdfunding, um, and maybe uh, <laughs> really for uh, I think 
especially as we're considering going forward in Title III, um, you know, passes and uh, where the world is opening up to unaccredited or non-accredited investors. Um, what's your perspective on uh, maybe some of the the risks that we're going to encounter, um, not not only to do with fraud, um, but some of the the more um, cultural aspects of risk. Yeah, so um, I think some of the panels uh, address this, and a Amy certainly did with um, uh, talking about you know how loans uh, could potentially be you know less risky than equity. Um, uh, you know, investing for equity in a very early stage startup. Um, you know, when you're uh, 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 Giving uh, when you have a loan, you actually have you know an agreement to get uh, a, a regular payment streams back, and 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 uh, in equity, you know you may you may get a multiple of your investment back, you may get your original investment back, or you may not get anything back. So, and and as uh, I mean, and and I think it, you also have to pay attention to seniority of you know how much. You know, I do this as a VC. I mean, when I look at an investment, how much subsequent investment is going to have to go into that company? And that will dilute your ownership, or in, in the case of debt, um, there may be senior debt coming in. So uh, I think it's just important to uh, evaluate all of those risks and know why you're investing. Um, I mean, is it just to support the entrepreneur? Uh, is it to make a certain you know hurdle rate of return uh, where you know I think you'd have to do a lot more diligence. Um, um, I, I like the idea of local, you know, um, I mean, there are different kind of vertical crowdfunding platforms, uh, including local ones or, or specific to industry that I think can de-risk some of the risks that um, investors would take. Are we allowed to, can I say something on this too? I care about this a lot. So I think people that claim they make investments purely for financial motivations, and David and I are cool, we, we talk about this stuff, but I <laughs> totally disagree with most of what he was saying up here about <laughs> social, and, but we're, we're good, we're good, <laughs> David, yeah. But I think like, I think it's just crazy to, to say that most people make investments purely for financial return without regard to what that business is doing. I mean, even if it's just a negative screen, like, well, I guess it'd be good to not invest in something that's creating nuclear weapons or whatever. Like, I, I mean, people have screens about social return, social impact, even if they're not what we have always have traditionally talked about in terms of social impact. And businesses don't just exist to make money. They obviously, I mean, mo most of them, think about and care about a customer, care about somebody that they're serving and they're creating something of value uh, okay. too. So I think it, the biggest question is how you define social impact and how we define that um, in, our, in society, we define that communally. And the thing that I, uh, I don't fear, but I, I think is just gonna be the, the most important, um, I guess, thing to, the thing to ask of both, again, entrepreneurs and the companies that are going to be utilizing these wonderful new crowdfunding tools is that we are very straightforward and transparent with our intentions, with our goals, social and otherwise, and just provide that information so that people can make good decisions and say, look, all us being equal, if the return, and who knows, <laughs> it's, we can't well, tell the future, if the return is going to be the same, what is the additional impact that I'm buying into? Because with Kiva and with other things that we've seen where there is no financial return, people are buying into and they want to participate in a story. They want to participate in something that they find valuable that's creating something beautiful in the world. So. Yeah, I think something to add on to that, um, if you aren't familiar, there's a new legal entity that you can create called a B Corp, other than a C Corp, um, where C Corps or LLCs, you have to have that fiduciary responsibility to your investors. 501c3s, all nonprofit, but B Corp allows you to actually take some uh, social considerations before a purely return uh, focus for your investors. So even the US has regulated something to help find that middle ground or a hybrid legal approach. Uh, so this is a question for, for all of you, but I think, I think it's relevant. You know, it's sort of to play devil's advocate. Uh, one of the, the, the institutional advantages of a VC firm, and, and, and you guys are certainly familiar with this, is that you just have the, the, the human capital to go and do the diligence on companies. Um, you have a team of associates that are going out and, and, and looking at the financials and, and interviewing the entrepreneurs and really getting a sense. So transparency is great. Um, we can, you know, having an openness about your intentions and your um, your risks mm -hmm. uh, is certainly um, it's laudable and it's important and it's necessary. Um, but how will how will we um, how does diligence work in the future of crowdfunding? Yeah, I can start on that. Um, diligence for crowdfunding is interesting um, because it ultimately does come down to the individual that's investing to do their own due diligence. Um, however, I think when you look at uh, how investing was done. Uh, before crowdfunding, 
um, in the days where there's another thing of crowdfunding of just angels have a long time done this crowdfunding for accredited investors. That's not new. Um, and they all share the due diligence doing it. Um, or when venture capital funds, oftentimes VCs will co-invest with other venture funds. And in that situation, you're leveraging each other's due diligence as well. Um, one of the downsides to that model is that everyone starts relying on everyone else doing the due diligence, and it becomes a herd mentality. And like, oh, well, this well-known VC is making the investment. I'm going to throw my money in, too, assuming that they did the job for me. Right. Um, and they just needed an extra $2 million. Um, so I think you have to be careful. But whether it's crowdfunding and an individual accredited, not accredited investor, it's on them in the end, just like it's on in the end for the VC to do it. Um, what I find interesting, yeah. I'm so well said. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, what I'm really interested about of what, where crowdfunding is going is co-investments between venture capital funds and crowdfunding platforms. Mm -hmm. um, and when Chance spoke, there's actually one of our deals is currently talking with Crowdfunder to see if we can do a co-investment with our fund and the, the crowdfunding platform. In that situation, it at least allows all the um, individual uh, investors on crowdfunder.com or any, any of them uh, to say, oh, this venture capital fund is going to be putting in $2 million on top of our capital. And so you have at least the leverage of knowing that some due diligence was done before, but again, do it yourself. But but then I I caution uh, you know as well, as I was saying before a VC investment uh, it, is is a very different animal in a lot of ways than you know some of the smaller businesses and in terms of expectations on return and and so uh, and and what subsequent capital is needed and uh, you know so. Um, you know, I, I think that's great, um, but I also think uh, you know individual investors should also uh, still ask those those questions and make sure they're aligned in terms of what the future. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, when you have with angel investors and any investor, you always have to be worried about that there's going to be future capital needs. Right. And VCs have probably a lot more capital than you do as an individual, and so we can keep funding future rounds, and you'll get diluted. Um, angel investors have the same problem whenever there's VCs that invest afterwards is will you be able to keep on participating at later stages to keep your ownership? Otherwise, you do face dilution. Mm -hmm. right. Can Go I ahead, just um, jump in on the co-investing? I, I <laughs> love that idea, too. Um, and um, it, it doesn't, I, I mean, in many ways, um, crowdfunding itself is a form of due diligence, right? We heard about Pandora earlier this morning that was turned down by VC after VC. Same with the Pebble Watch. Well, when you have 69,000 people order your watch, you know, that suggests that it's a, a pretty good idea and there's demand for it. So I think the crowdfunding portion can really act as due diligence and give some of the other players, whether it's an angel investor or um, you know, a local incubator or economic development fund or foundation or even a community bank, give these people the um, confidence and that extra, you know, sort of um, due diligence, um, you know, yes factor to be able to um, come in and actually invest alongside or on top of that. Um, and I, I think we're going to see a lot of, um, you know, models like that evolve. And there's one right now that we could point to, and that's Somoland, um, based in Cincinnati. And on their site today, they have banks, um, uh, foundations, um, credit unions, chambers of commerce, uh, municipal governments, the city of Cleveland. They're all lending on this platform to local companies, um, along with uh, friends and family and accredited investors, which are the only part of the public right now that's allowed to participate. Can I say, are you, Good. Can, yeah. is that all right? Yeah. So one of the things I just really want to appreciate about what we've all sort of been saying is that, um, you know, we have this ridiculous world where we divide ourselves, apparently, between accredited and unaccredited. And then to make matters even more ridiculous, it's sophisticated and unsophisticated because there's this, somebody decided at some point there's a correlation between wealth and intelligence, apparently, which <laughs> pisses me off. So anyway, I think it's great for pointing out that, like, oh, all these, like, these poor little, you know, unaccredited investors that haven't been able to participate, they're going to really have to pay attention. Yeah, so do VCs, and so do professional investors, and so does everyone else, even if they're accredited. Like, it's great that we are pointing out that we're all human beings that have to use our brains to make smart investments. Like, that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. so. um, I'm going to, there was a question earlier today, um, I believe it was this gentleman in the front that asked, um, really about the, the if, if once you open it up and, and you you go from having maybe you know ten or fifteen investors in an early round to all of a sudden you're having a hundred or two hundred or a thousand or ten thousand um, who all um, are demanding you know information and, and transparency um, what sort of uh, you've worked with 
entrepreneurs before and and there's a dialogue uh, and I'm sure your entrepreneurs have prepared decks for you just to update you on you know um, what's going on at their company uh, how does this how does this world work in the future um, where uh, entrepreneurs are communicating with um, potentially thousands of, of investors I'd say one thing is it definitely goes the difference between uh, if you have board members or just investors, right? The big difference when you're getting investment from a venture capital fund is that we're usually taking a board role and playing an active role in helping you out, whether it's helping you get employees, clients, additional capital afterwards. Um, like I'm usually at one of our portfolio companies' offices at least once or twice a, a week. Um, if you end up going with uh, the crowdfunding side, you'll have lots of investors, but not necessarily the most helpful investors. Some of them can be, and hopefully you can figure out ways to engage them and use them as your initial fan base to propel your success. But they're totally different on the utility of, of being having them as investors. Um, I, are we going to move to Q&A? Is that OK? Yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's do that. So uh, as we've said before, uh, Mike, on the side, keep your questions short, avoid long <laughs> statements if possible. So, uh, there we go, David. Uh, any other any other folks that also have questions? If not, we'll just uh, keep going out. Oh, we'll take yeah. So I want to take issue a little bit uh, with the, um, uh, the 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 discussion that uh, debt uh, investments are less risky than equity investments. I don't agree. Um, you know, there's a reason that the um, the debt industry, uh, debt financing, is done almost exclusively by institutions because the complexity of credit analysis and the terms of the debt are far, far, far more complex than a simple equity investment. I don't know that in, in, in you know, with all due respect to your comment about, you know, you don't have to be rich to be smart, um, it is really, you know, uh, something that the average person would find very, very difficult to get their arms around in terms of risk analysis. And, but and you think equity is easier? I think equity is easier, yeah. For people to understand risk. Because I thought you started off by saying debt and equity are not, you know, you, you take issue with the idea that debt is less risky than equity, which I don't agree necessarily with. I just think they're different structures. Well, yeah, but I'm saying that the, the every debt investment has an inherent risk of default and and for a startup company to be issuing debt without the resources necessarily to service that debt or ultimately repay it is far far more likely than a mature business that, that enters the debt markets um, I, I don't think any of us said that um, I mean I would only assume that a company is issuing debt if there or that an investor would invest in the company if there was a, a revenue stream or, or you know some collateral against that debt so that was my assumption yeah. right I, I would I, say fundamentally there's so many different ways to disagree with what you said um, on the debt being more risky than equity. And I don't think any of us said that, but debt by its own nature, being senior everything else, is less risky. You get your money back before you, even equity holders. If, if, if the issuer is credit worthy. Well, yeah, but they're, and they're also an established going concern. So right. maybe it's you're already a customer. Well, you go there all the time. I was talking about the startup context. Oh, I, I mean, I yeah. okay. Yeah, there, that's yeah. 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 So well, a startup equity is probably more um, appropriate because they don't have revenue yet. They're usually pre-revenue, and that's why I think debt is particularly suited for some of these small businesses who may have a hard time getting a bank loan, not because they're not worthy but because you know banks are so heavily regulated and you have to fit into that perfect you know square peg otherwise you're not getting a loan so there are a lot of I, I do think it's a place for alternative yeah. financing you know structures okay um, yeah. but the last comment i'd say is um and most also that that's also a lot simpler than equity in that if you're doing convertible debt a lot of times startups are doing convertible notes and it's just a lot easier. The <laughs> lawyers charge you a tenth of what it is to do a convertible note document than it is a PPM for an equity round because it is a lot easier to do and it's less risky. So I think, and I think also it just I, I hate to say the general answer of well, I think it it all depends, but I do think that debt can be very straightforward and clear. What's up there, but every single business has you know a set of unknowns and a set of known factors, and sometimes even lending three hundred bucks to a goat herder is actually very straightforward and simple and. Under, and easy to understand, and equity would make no sense in a lot of the startup situations. But I hear what you're saying. 
Okay. Hello. I'll lean around the column as well. This is a question on investing alongside the crowd. Right now, the ability to invest alongside the crowd is impeded significantly by the SEC's integration doctrine. And as far as I know, we haven't seen any rumblings that there's going to be a safe harbor against the integration doctrine as there is for a six-month trailing 506 offering. Do any of you have any intelligence about the invest alongside the crowd possibilities or whether the SEC is actually going to come out with a rule that lets accredited in this ridiculous distinction um, invest alongside the crowd, invest alongside the unaccredited? I mean, do you mean? Sorry. I guess I, I do understand what you're saying. I mean, I think if an accredited person wants to invest, they have no shortage of opportunities to jump into the crowdfunding offering. So if they want to be a big piece of that offering, they could do that. Alongside meaning staged or um, you know, in some sort of order, like first crowdfunding, then additional. Right, then a gap, then a 506. Yeah, unfortunately, I think it's just that there's going to be a huge time delay, right? You have to, I think it's a, a year. I haven't, my brain isn't. Yeah, so, I mean, I watched now. the riveting SEC discussion <laughs> of general solicitation <laughs> yeah. last week, um, and this was not addressed, um, I think, intentionally. Um, yeah. So, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, sorry. All right, so sorry, uh, we've got probably three more answers. questions and just a little bit less than five minutes. David, please. As con condensed okay. as you possibly uh, can make your question. This panel proves there's a spectrum. Yay. The end. <laughs> um, <laughs> the real opportunity in the alongside thing, I believe, comes from figuring out how to combine the collaboration economy with the merging of investor interests on the spectrum in a way that you get leverage across all of the opportunities so you have successful businesses that don't have to scale globally mm -hmm. and give the right returns. Mm -hmm. And you have successful businesses where it makes sense to scale globally and give the right returns to the right players. How do we get out of the silos that currently keep that from happening? And do you see interesting situations where the different players are beginning to have conversations where the impact investors are talking to the corporate venture capital folks and where the governments are coming in and saying, we'd like to buy jobs, but we'd like to buy better job engines. And we consider a better job engine a better investment, even if it isn't making the returns that those other guys care about. How is that all going to come together cross silos so that we end up getting the real impact of, in essence, sharing the spectrum of returns mm -hmm. to the people who care most about each return. I think Great, I would start off by saying you should take uh, yeah, for e each of the, the silos that you're talking about, every investment vehicle has to have a purpose. And crowdfunding, the purpose of the crowdfunding purpose is to get lots of people investing in one entity, versus a VC is just an entity with a lot of money picking and choosing on its own. Um, I think what I'm curious about happening to, to do is how, how will VCs look at the purpose of crowdfunding for them? And one way is you could certainly structure a deal by saying, look, we will give you $2 million if you can prove there's social demand for you to go raise $500,000 on a crowdfunding platform. If you can't do it, there's no social proof, we won't invest. Um, so you can use it as milestones for that, for, for validation. Um, but I think everything has to be looked at as what's the purpose for that type of investment. Field. And, and I, I've also actually uh, I've been involved with several private public funds that uh, do what you said in terms of I mean uh, someone mentioned that you know taking the initial loss um, and and so they're repurposing dollars for you know job creation into a fund uh, you know without necessarily caring about the return but caring about um, you know creating uh, more businesses and, and, and job growth. And and, and so, um, and some corporates, uh, you know, have been involved in that. So, so we're starting to to see more of that as as governments realize that um, uh, you know the traditional job creation uh, programs may not be working. Yeah, and just to answer that from a different perspective, um, I give a lot of talks, and a lot of times um, the audience is is people involved in economic development in an area. And um, it's really interesting. They see crowdfunding as um, a potential way for them to really be much more effective with economic development and creating jobs in their communities. Um, and in fact, in the UK, you had the government of David Cameron put um, stimulus funds into one of their small business lending crowdfunding sites to stimulate lending because their banks 
are like our banks, and they weren't lending very much. Um, but so right now, because of where we are with crowdfunding, you're not really seeing that here. There are sites like Fund St. Louis, um, Fund Waterloo, that's Waterloo, Ontario. Um, and so right now they're doing donation-based, but you could kind of imagine those evolving. And if you had these you know, governments, local governments, kind of getting behind it and bringing the right players together, I mean, I don't know what the legalities of that are for them, but um, I think it's an interesting model. And I, I know that people are looking at it and very interested in it. All right, we two more questions. Let's keep them short, guys. We're okay. going to wrap up. Got it. Um, I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, so traditional fund structures right, generally have LPs or, or par, um, individuals that invest within the fund um, that could p potentially uh, are of some value to the portfolio companies in which the fund invests. Um, so what are, do you think that, for example, in the case of crowdfunding, um, the lack or just sort of the, the fact that there's so many different individuals, um, do you think that could potentially be sort of a negative side of, of crowdfunding, um, the fact that they don't necessarily have the same sort of strategic partnering capabilities of traditional fund structures? And if so, um, going along the lines of the accredited investors, um, the old adage is money makes money. So um, what do these people who are unaccredited investors have to offer in terms of uh, networking? I, can I go? Okay. So I think the unaccredited are people too. And they <laughs> may have very strategic connections, even more strategic than some of the LPs which are often like big entities and nameless, faceless things that do not get involved with their portfolio companies. Sometimes, you know, some, sometimes that's not the case. But often it's the, the team that's running the fund that is like the most involved in my understanding. Um, unaccredited, I've seen unaccredited folks and the, the crowd sort of not just be customers, which is one of the most obvious, but also have, like you, you made the recommendation of when you're investing in, um, it, you know, in, in small startups or in small businesses, invest in something you know and love. Like if on the side you love to cook, invest in something where maybe some of that knowledge, some of your expertise could be helpful to that entrepreneur if that entrepreneur is seeking it. I don't know that entrepreneurs always want to have all thousand people contribute all their 10 cents to, um, you know, and put pitch in their opinion on what they're doing. But I do think there can be, there's just that many more individuals that are literally invested to call on when there's a need for, um, not just financially, not just financially strategic partners, but all sorts of other strategic partners. So, short answer. I, just to add one thing, I think I think actually, you know, um, potentially even more interesting question is I think um, to what extent can can platforms um, be the sort of uh, exchange between um, the crowdfunding investors and the entrepreneur, and and how a platform can make it more efficient um, and to encourage yeah. a dialogue that's helpful for the entrepreneur, but sort of blocks out the um, you know the crazy investors that want to have input into every single decision that's made. Can I say one super fast? I'm going to talk fast, but it's such a good story. So on ProFounder, there was a woman who had to raise like $100,000 for her whale watching company, right? So cool. And she started to build her pitch and started to reach out to investors and was like, here's my budget. Here's what I need. And one of the line items was this particular kind of inflatable boat thing that is great for whale watching adventures off of Seattle, in Seattle or whatever. Anyway, so one of the investors like saw this, was, was, was thinking about it, and was at the laundromat and saw a little like tear off ta sheet that this dude was selling a boat for, not $50,000, whatever she thought it would cost in her budget, but like $20,000. So he's like, oh, I'm gonna save this and give it to my friend. She was able to not raise that additional capital she needed, but instead get this connection through her random unaccredited crowdfunding <laughs> investor guy to get her boat. No, I'm not, no, I know, I'm just using you as an example. Sorry to make you, yeah the other side of this. But so, um, so I think that's an awesome example and there are stories like that all the time where if you have that many more eyeballs under, on your business, seeing what's going on, cheering you on, you can have random laundromat, serendipitous boat things happen. That was, that, by the way, that was fast. That was like David Rose fast. Yeah. 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 And one more thing, if, if you're a startup and you're developing product, all of these people, your unaccredited investors, are actually helping you develop that and giving you input along the way and you end up with a much um, better product at the end. Yeah, I think the, the last thing I would say to that is that one of the challenges that crowdfunding platforms have is it generates so much noise, and there needs to be good tools for filtering noise. So if once you have your 100 investors through a crowdfunding platform, what's an easy way that you can reach out to them and say, hey, I'm looking for a CTO, or I'm looking for a new client that fits these parameters, and everyone gives their feedback, but it, you know, everyone can vote on them, and it ranks it up quickly like, uh, Cora does for question and answers, uh, but filtering out noise will probably be the biggest thing to do. Um, when you have LPs in a fund, uh, if you have individual LPs, that they can be a little bit more active. But you're right; if it's institutional LPs, really hard to get any type of feedback. 
um, but they certainly have a lot of value beyond being a client. Sure. They have a wealth of, just look, at, if you could connect all of their LinkedIn profiles of all of your investors or, and see where that leads you, um, hu huge wealth beyond the capital they're giving you. Can I any final thoughts? No, I mean, I, I, I agree with this. I, I think uh, that technology actually creates a potential to, to create links between, um, you know, between investors, whether it's, it's a VC fund we're talking about or, uh, you know, a, a crowdfunding platform. So. Awesome. Um, remember, unaccredited investors are people too. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, great job. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks you. Thank you. Uh,